and ethics. I said, yes, um, that is core to everything that we do, that being ethics. Um, there are a lot of rules and considerations in working with critically imperiled species at all, but certainly with plants. So I hope to weave that through storytelling today and give you a sense of the thought processes we go through. I'm part of the science and conservation team at the State Botanical Garden of Georgia. These are all our beautiful names, but this is more important. These are our beautiful faces. Uh, this is my plant family at the Botanical Garden, Director Cruz Sanders, Heather Alley, you're gonna hear a lot about, um, wonderful colleagues. So all these stories, they're not, if this is not the Jennifer Seska show, the, these are our stories, this team's stories, and we all contribute with hive mind to this work. This is our home, the Mimsy Lanier Center for Native Plant Studies behind the scene at the Botanical Garden. Just a bit about our home. And this is Captain Alley. She's a legit sea captain, um, seventh generation. She has spent time on a ship, but she runs, she's the manager of the Mimsy Lanier Center. And she grows all of our plants for conservation, for imperiled species safeguarding, for restoration, for education, for plant sales. And we are named for Mimsy Lanier, who has raised our operating budget uh, since 1995. Um, she helped launch everything that we've done, everything that we've created and works behind the scenes. And we were grateful she let us put her name on our center. We didn't think she would because that's her soul, but she's essential to our work. And here's Captain Alley. So all the plant stories that you're gonna hear and other people that raise the plants, there are conservation horticulturists like Heather Alley. And these are the folks that have been rearing our collections this year with COVID. So no volunteers, not many students, but graduate student, Rachel Smith and conservation outreach coordinator, Lauren Muller raising 10,000 plants for a variety of projects at the Mimsy Lanier Center. This is a picture from early days. Now it's masks and separation, um, but to give you a sense of the head house. And before I get too far, you need to know our hearts. And you need to know our why. We are crazy plant people. We work really hard to get people to see plants and understand plants. And if we have to put eyelashes on plants, we'll do that. My teaching model is Jack Black from School of Rock. So now you know and we may be a little provocative as in pushing um, pushing memes or stories or jokes or something just to get people to think about plants and regard plants. So, so brace yourself. For example, this is how we roll. Watching, you can't watch a movie with us without us going, hey, that's Sansevieria. It's actually the genus has been renamed Dracenia and that's not gonna make it outside in the winter all year. Anyway, this is how we roll and this is how we roll. We are all about the plants and the people and the love and the plants. I hope you're laughing at the plant memes because they are my favorite. Quickly, we weave conservation and conservation ethics into everything, including our native plant sale. This is all on our website. So visit our pages. If you want to read more, you're going to hear about the Georgia Plant Conservation Alliance. This is our extended plant family across Georgia. Habitat restoration is a big part of what we do under Powerline Rights of Way. In particular, the Native Plant Initiative that Alfie mentioned, getting natives into the hands of people, the Georgia Milkweed Initiative. These are all essential programs that we run. And the Georgia Pollinator Plants of the Year is a newer program, as is the Learning by Leading with students. We have nine young women working with us in plant conservation in the SICON team this year. Um, all on, they're all scholars doing this work on top of their college curricula. They're extraordinary. And then Connect to Protect. And Connect to Protect is a gardening activity like the Connect to Protect Gardens downtown Athens and around the state. But it's also um, a gardening philosophy and an ethic. Um, and we're gonna talk about that. Um, warning. You cannot spend time with conservation biologists without the burden of knowledge. You're gonna learn things that you can't unsee. For example, if you love mimosa trees, I'm sorry, you can no longer be friends. I used to play uh, Charlie's Angels in Grand Prairie, Texas, as a matter of fact, and this mimosa tree was in my fr friend Angie's front yard and that was our home base. I don't know why, but the mimosa tree was base. And um, I loved that tree, but it's invasive. You can't 
you can't like invasive plants anymore. They're just too big a boy. So burden of knowledge, you may have loved Chinese wisteria. You can no longer like it. This, these are photos actually from the botanical garden. We had so many weddings here. It was much beloved, but it's invasive and we spent our time removing fruits. So conservation ethics, some things you just can't, you can't have anymore because of their invasive burden. So here's a plant meme. Yes, ma'am, they're very creepy, but which one strangled your husband's? We work hard to show people that not all green is good and help people see the green in their daily lives. And we want you to love, it's called American wisteria, but we say nay nay, we like Georgia wisteria. Okay, this is a bit on how we roll. We talk about invasive species, introduced species, naturalized species. They all have different categories. Invasive means, no kidding, escaping a botanical garden or a home garden, entering a natural area and taking over a site, removing resources from the native plant community that was there. Whereas this uh, oxide daisy, it's naturalized, it's not native, but it's a pretty, it's a well-behaved guest and it's uh, moved across the, United States and into Canada and is well behaved, not to the point of taking resources away. So it's got a softer name, naturalized. You're gonna be hearing these things. And just so you know my heart, I have many native plants in my home garden, but I have non-native plants too. And as long as they're well behaved, they are welcome as long as they do no harm. Okay, plant blindness is a thing. If I flashed a picture at you and said, what did you see? And maybe it was a, a, a critter, a, a beautiful silverback gorilla lounging in a tree. You might say silverback gorilla. And I might ask you anything else in the picture. And you're like, no, that beautiful silverback gorilla. And I would say, oh, but the tree. And we are wired to see with our, you know, our lizard brains, our hind brains, we are wired to see animals, but plants are essential to the quality of our life and to our daily lives. And plant blindness is just not seeing that and recognizing that and what happens when people don't have plants in their lives or regard for plants and plant diversity. So not all green is good invasive plants, but wouldn't it be nice to learn some language of plants, to know the plants that you're seeing and uh, create connections with plants by knowing their name. And it could be Latin names, it could be common names. It's just knowing your name. It, it's the difference between a neighbor that you go, hey, how y'all doing versus, oh, hey, John Calabria, how's it going? How's Jennifer doing? She's doing fine. And the kids are, oh, we're good and la la la. That's a different relationship. So why not learn some plant names um, and make some connections? And maybe learning botany is a good idea because this could happen. Maybe you don't want to park your car underneath the Redford tree because, hmm. So learning plants and invasive plants could be good. This is my heart. I have high regard for dandelions, so no disparaging questions about dandelions, please. Now you know plant memes. And this is how we roll. So I like this unmown hell strip or boulevard strip in the middle of a street. I think that's a great thing. Those dandelions host bees in the early season. And why not? I might not call these weeds. I might call these wildflowers. So dandelions, do lovely things. And there's early European weeds that come out in our gardens that aren't invasive to the point of kudzu, um, you know, hen bits, things like that. They do host bees and they are welcome. I happen to love the weed wildflowers like daisy fleabane, so please do not disparage the daisy fleabane. It's actually a workhorse in pollination circles. So this is my face the entire time should you disparage the weed wildflowers as weeds. Just saying now you know. So this is me and mine, our team, talking about plants. We hope we don't come across this way. We worry that we do. We try, we, our, our goal is to move heart forward. And this is definitely us. A chance to talk about plants. I will geek out on plants at a moment's notice. Would you give a talk on yes, when? Yes, <laughs> I will talk about plants. Yes, when? And here we go. This is this is a botanist being provocative. Um, lawns are great. Uh, if you have lawn, I hope you are enjoying it. 
wrestling with your kids, throwing the frisbee, playing bocce ball, playing soccer, lying on your back, looking at the stars, having a picnic, all those things. But I think we could do more and I think we could do better with our space because biodiversity needs us. And we're gonna get into that a little bit about being provocative. Um, honeybees have brought, the plight of honeybees have brought a lot of attention to pollinators and we all hold on to their little legs and ride with those honeybees all the way to get people to hear our stories. But for us, in conservation and ethics. Honeybees are wonderful for cultural reasons and for farming reasons and for economic reasons and social insects are fast, fascinating. And these, and it sports jobs, all the things. But for conservation, we are keenly interested in native bees and native pollinators and telling their stories. So I'm like, yes, the honeybees are great, but come, come walk with me, come walk with me. Let me show you, let me, let me show you what I see. And then you can teach people. So this is this is a bit how we feel. About it. It's a horrible picture. It's kind of funny. It's meant to be provocative to get you to think. Okay. Okay. Because the bumblebees. And where are the bumblebees? They're on the native plants. And where are the native plants? That's a great question. And they are essential. They are essential because we are losing things. We are things being species, systems. For the first time in my conservation career since 95, I always thought, you know, I would do as much as I could for plant conservation, carry it forward and pass it on to the next generation. We have 30 years or less to get native plants back on the land or we're going to lose bee species and bird species. Imagine 90, more than 90% of the Southeastern forest were gone. Now imagine it is true, 90% of the grasslands of the South are gone. And how many of you, if we were in a, interactive space, I would ask you, how many of you knew that there were prairies in Georgia, not just the coastal plain and the longleaf um, ecosystem and the wiregrass communities, but in the Piedmont and in the mountains? Research is showing that maybe 65% or more of our land was a grassland habitat with sunlight coming through trees, widely spaced trees to the forest floor. We've lost those understory wildflowers and grasses. And so we're losing these bee and bird species on our watch. Three and four eastern meadowlarks are gone. Birds that rely on grasslands for brooding and breeding, overwintering, insecting, is that the thing? When they eat, what do baby birds eat? They eat caterpillars. They don't eat bird seed. They don't eat fruits. They eat caterpillars. Where are the caterpillars? They are on native plants. So in the southeast, we have this decline of grasslands habitat. Where are grasslands? And I'll lay that there and let you think about it. The Southeastern Grasslands Initiative has a beautiful website. Please check it out. The video is a, is a great storyteller. 49% of the rare habitats in the Southeastern United States are grassland type. Even if they have trees, the trees are widely spaced so that sunlight can come to the forest floor. G1 and G3 at the bottom of your screen, we're gonna talk about rarity ranks. That means globally rare. Glo G1 is the most globally rare. G3, pretty solidly rare. G5, pretty common on the planet. So we, when we, I look at you and say, oh my gosh, this is a G1 plant community, or wow, this is a G1 plant species. You're gonna go, oh, oh, pay attention. So check out the Southeastern Grasslands Initiative. We're a partner organization with them and sunlight's important. And I went to school for a long time. I am the Lorex, I speak for the trees, right, Dr. Seuss? And yet I spend a lot of my time removing trees from habitat to improve quality of habitat for conservation. That's a thing, that's a thing. Um, Doug Tallamy, you may have heard of his books. This was a the wonderful books that he's written about getting people to see that if you love birds, you will plant native plants because we have to have native plants to have native insects. Everything else is just plastic as far as nature is concerned. This was in, uh, this article was in, what was it, the New York, oh, the Washington Post in February of this year. So the conservation ethics 
you know, when I started, we focused on the critically imperiled plant species. And we also focused on the invasive species, getting them off the land. And now a lot of our conservation work and our end conservation ethics coming into keeping the common plants common and known and functioning, ecologically connected. And it sounds daunting and it sounds scary, but it's remarkable if we all did a little bit, the impact we could have because gardening can help. And it matters what plants you put in your garden, but even if you have a patio garden, planting native plants, one mint, mint, native mint, like a pycnanthemum, that would help. Native plants are downtown Athens. And the Audubon Society, the local group, contacted us because they saw goldfinches in downtown Athens for the first time in over 40 years. And these, you know, they have eBird, they track this data. The birds, can find the plants, the bees can find the plants, the monarchs can find the plants. They just have to have the plants on the land and research is showing every little bit helps. So this connect to protect for biodiversity, it encompasses everything that we do. Potted gardens, built landscapes, getting people to see plants, to see plants as essential in their lives. It can be, a, these could be formal gardens, these could be Pocket prairies. This is an old field that, with strategic mowing, um, has be is being restored towards natives. And um, remarkable, the number of plants that have reemerged from this site that were waiting in the seed bank. So think about prairie plants. Their roots are up to eight feet deep. Extraordinary. They're long-lived perennials, and they are waiting for sunlight. They will live over a hundred years. Just eking out, not flowering until they get sunlight. They just need a space. And again, we're thinking, where are these pocket prairies? Where do we find sun loving spaces for plants? Quick, quick, um, Alfie may be able to, Professor Vic may be able to share this with you, but uh, just a quick, quick about biodiversity. Mm -hmm. So Georgia has remarkable amounts of, of diversity. Um, we rank seventh in the United States. So that's behind places like Florida, Texas, California, Hawaii with remarkable plant diversity. We're right up there. We have 158 species that are protected and we're gonna talk about that. And the state wildlife action plan is really important. But check this out. Mm -hmm. So the convention on mm -hmm. um, biodiversity they are tracking biodiversity around the planet. What if, if you have so much time and so much money, so many intellectual resources and physical resources, and you have to prioritize where you're gonna do conservation, let's look at everything we've got and see what's most critically rare. And my goodness, we're gonna make sure we work on that. So they have these conservation hotspots. Just a few years ago, they add their added their 36 biodiversity hotspots and it's the North American coastal plain. 1500 species endemic, only growing in the Southeastern coastal plain and 70% habitat loss in this space. So you know this space, Macon and South. We have remarkable diversity in Georgia because we've got everything from the mountains to the barrier islands. We have all the soils, all the climate, all the wonderful things going on great diversity, which comes with great responsibility. Um, these are maps just, show, just looking at the colors. Fish that are endemic to the Southeast, all the way to trees that are endemic to the Southeast. We live in a botanically rich area. Again, a gift with responsibility. Um, Georgia is number one in plants, in plant diversity and taxa. This is new, this was 2018. We're above Florida. We like to fill out that just a little bit. And these are where we know our critically imperiled plants are. Now, what you might notice is our clusters of these along the Altamaha River, oh, around uh, the North Georgia Mountains, National Forest Land, around Atlanta. A lot of botanists live in Atlanta, around Fort Benning. In Fort Stewart, you see a lot of dots. There are reasons why. Most of our work that we do in conservation is on land owned by the state 
like these lands, I put, we put most of our time into restoring endangered plants to the wild to state land and to federal land like these places on the maps. There's a lot of space without color in this map. Over 90%, over 95% of the land in Georgia is privately owned. And that's important for plants because plants are only protected on land owned by the federal government. Goes by old English law, uh, uh, the lords could own the animals, the serfs could have their food plots. That's where the law derives from. So if Professor Alfie Vick had the last Georgia Trillium on his personal property, he could do with it as he wished. And there would be nothing to do about that except cultivate a relationship with him and his family and, and ask permission to come see important conservation ethics, you always have to ask permission to come see. And hey, can I tell you about this cool plan on your land or you maybe you already know about it and maybe some things we could do to help it and maybe we could uh, collect some seeds and take them to the botanical garden. Now the Endangered Species Act does provide protection for plants on federal land and that's great. Something that I need you to pay attention to are these rankings. Now I know endangered and threatened numbers of populations and we could get into those details, but mostly just to get your head around the diversity, the global rank, remember we talked about the G rank, but also the S rank. So I carry, I and my team, a responsibility for the diversity within Georgia. That is what is on my watch. And so if something is an S1, it's state rare. It might be common in another state, that doesn't matter. The genetics, the populations in Georgia are under our watch and the, that's gonna be a conservation priority for us. The Georgia Wildflower Preservation Act of 1973 is remarkable. You think of all the ways Georgia is at the bottom of different kinds of lists, you know, lists. Um, but we're one of the few states with a state protected wildflower list. It regulates the trade of these species. It provides funding for these species. And these plants are listed in the State Wildlife Action Plan. And now that federal legislation has passed, our, we are up for money for restoration because our state already had this act in 1973. Alabama doesn't have this. North Carolina doesn't have plants in their state wildlife action plan. We are very far ahead and it's our department of natural resources very forward thinking and realizing that plants are essential to wildlife. Plants are not defined at the federal level as wildlife yet, it's coming. But without plants, the animals don't exist. And it's part of why I got into conservation with plants. That and I get really seasick, which is another story I'll tell you later. This looks like coral. This is not coral, these are plants. This is the whole in situ, ex situ loop. So conservation ethics, yes, bring plants to the botanical garden, study them, put their seeds in a seed bank for long-term storage. Yes, yes, yes. Those are all important tools for conservation, but we gotta close that loop. Plant conservation has to happen in the wild. Those plants need to be returned to the wild. They can only live at our plant zoo for a certain amount of time. Seed, seeds decline in seed banks, but the research is showing um, because molecules vibrate in place, even frozen down to zero temperatures. So we have to replenish that. So conservation, we can never think we've got a species backed up and say, oh, we're done. We can never stop. And plants are essential. So we close that loop by bringing the plants, learning about the life history at the botanical garden, increasing the plants and planting them back into the wild, which is what I'm gonna tell you about. These are, this is a list of names. Don't even worry about the names. Just look at the column there with global rank, all those G ones, and then look at all those S ones. So state rare species, populations that are rare are our important watch. This is an article that came out in the New York Times 10 days ago, um, written by colleagues of ours, um, trying to document the extinct plants of the United States. We have, there's actually way more, many more species that have winked out on our watch. Um, 
and an interesting read and an important read and several of the species um, that are that are critically rare that are endemic if they have restricted ranges like hairy rattleweed which I, who i will introduce you to very soon they have a we have a special obligation to them to take care of them something that's just critically rare on the planet anyway it's a restricted endemic there's two in georgia there's many more that have just a very few populations those are high on our conservation list. Now, why? Why are plants going extinct faster than animals? Seven times faster than animals. Why? You know, you're gonna be going, because they have roots, they can't get up and run. I'm gonna be going, yes. Why is the audience? Thank you, that's exactly right. Because plants can adapt to the changes happening quickly enough around them. So if you were a trillium living at the base of this tree and your forest changed and, and you were suddenly in full sun, could you adapt to those changes quickly enough? Plants cannot adapt to the changes quickly enough. They cannot get up and leave when there's loss of habitat. And certain plants only can live in certain habitats. And we have not mastered the cultivation of, of many rare plants. We just have not figured out the science of it, the art of it. And we try, well, we try. So some plants can only live in rock outcrops. Um, it's really hard to live underneath asphalt. And I, I commute from Gainesville, Georgia to Athens, Georgia for 20, well, uh, 25, I don't even know what the math is, years. And I used to grumble about woods going to farms and now these farms are for sale. So here's Harry. He can only grow in certain soils in Wayne and Brantley County in Southwest Georgia. That's near Jessup, Georgia. Nama said, y'all, he's a G1. S1 and you're going to go, whoa, my mind is blown because you know now. This is beautiful hairy rattleweed. He's in the pea family. He's a legume, baptisia, arachnifera, arachnose hairs. He's fuzzy, fuzzy. Who does not love fuzzy? Hairy. And he only grows on line, uh, land that is pine plantation. And with the harvesting of those pines every 20 years, there's Harry has been through three rotations, so 60 years of rotations and the populations have dropped by 90%. So can we have land that we set aside for Harry? I'm just gonna lay that there and see if y'all ask me about the next part of that story later. So some plants only have special places where they can live. And do we bring them to the botanical garden? Actually, Harry lives with us. And for the first time in 15 years of trying, Harry Rattleweed made viable seeds this year. We had pregnant Harry's and we have hairy babies. That sounds really weird, but it's true. Actually, they're not hairy the first year, but that's another story. So some plants can only live in pitcher plant bogs. So loss of habitat to construction, loss of habitat to suppression of fire, loss of habitat due to chemicals, cow poop washing into the site and changing the chemistry, and also poaching. Poaching is a big problem. There is wild collecting wild crafting, people that have these connections with the land, know the plants, sustainably harvest and use and revere plants. That is not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is poaching. And poaching is a real problem. Certainly you've heard stories of ginseng, American ginseng, our native medicinal plants, our native ferns, our native lady slippers, um, button mosses are all poached from the national forest from state lands to the point of extinction. Our charismatic species like orchids, our charismatic species like our carnivorous plants, our sexy plants like pitcher plants. White top pitcher plant was poached to extinction in Georgia in 1987. And none of the botanical gardens had any Georgia leucos, Saracenia leuco, phila leuco, white, phila leaf. Look at those hairs. Um, nobody had Georgia white tops in cultivation. It is seed bank at a botanical garden, but a collector had them. So do we bring leucophilus from Mississippi and bring them back? That's another mythical story we could talk about. There are farms in other states where they sustainably harvest the pitchers. What happened to our Georgia leucos is that somebody took the whole plants. 
And that's really frustrating too, because this it can the plants are grown from tissue culture. There are sources in the trade. It's easy to grow these things from seed. Why take the whole plants? This commercial trade is actually, we're celebrating because they do beautiful things. They harvest sustainably pictures for the flower industry. So here's the thing, your smooth cone flower, Echinacea levigata, it's a very tall, sexy, sexy wildflower. Smooth legs, smooth stems. See, we, we try to get you to see plants. No hairs on the stems, it's, whereas regular purple cone flower is very coarse. This plant occurs on federal land, so national forest land. This is a picture from way back in 1997. Cindy Wentworth was charged with keeping these safe. And for several years in a row, somebody was coming along and taking all the seeds from the, the wild populations. And the parent plants sometimes got scraped off the side of the road because of road maintenance and accident, total accident, but an impact on the population. These prairie plants living on a roadside. Where do some living plants live? We've been thinking about this. Here's a mountain prairie plant eking out its existence on a roadside. And it's being poached from federal land, the only place it's protected. And there are people that monitor and manage and try to care for it. And they got caught and they got a $150 fine. Mm, take that. Loss of habitat because cars go mudding in a wetland like a pitcher plant bog. Can you see the little pitcher plants? That is like cutting the veins of a, of a, that's a terrible metaphor, but cutting the veins of a, of a, a wetland habitat because it makes the water go into creeks instead of flowing in a sheet and that kills the habitat. Do I think people were like, ooh, pitcher plant bogs, let's go get them with our dune buggies. Do people still have dune buggies with our ATVs? No, I don't think that. I think they didn't know. And wonderful that Georgia Power and other partners came forward and put up fences, which is great are rock outcrops. There are plants that are endemic that only live here in these depression, like moon craters. You've been to Stone Mountain, you've seen these moon craters. They're, they live as seeds most of the year, these endangered plants on rock outcrops. When, when people disturb them, run their mountain bikes through there, it impacts the populations for years. You can see the scars, like on a manatee's back. Are people going, ooh, let's go get the Draba apricot, or ooh, let's go get the or elf or pines? No, they're not. They're not out to get them. I, I think it's just that people don't know and we don't have this connection. So lots of concerns, but a lot of people stepping forward to help plants in Georgia as a group since 1995, checking time. And this is the Georgia Plant Conservation Alliance. We started as a small group of five or so organizations and we are now over 56 organizations, um, more than 220 individuals. We have volunteers, we have students, which are essential. We have uh, federal agencies. We have organizations with horticulture capacity, meaning they can grow plants and we have to grow them in certain ways, always tracking provenance, the source population and never mixing populations. That's conservation ethics is very important. These people show up, there are no dues or anything, but there's also no reward except for doing good work. They show up and they commit to the conservation of critically imperiled species. We call these the GPCA 105 and all their plant populations. And look, a hundred of the 105 are heliophytes, are sun loving. A lot of work to get sun back on the land, y'all. A lot of work cutting down trees, I'm afraid, to restore habitat. But look at this, 19 of these species are G1S1, 81 are S1. They are very special to Georgia and they are part of our challenge. So it takes a lot, we, it, we spend a lot of time trying to find the species in the wild and that takes expertise. And conservation ethics wise, you have to have permission before you go on someone's land. State and federal land, you have to have permission, but private land, you, I cannot walk in there without permission and, and look at these species. 
collecting seeds, our most important thing that we do is the regard and preservation we have of the wild populations and collecting seeds is among the biggest impact we could have because we're removing material from the wild population. We have to follow very careful rules. There's a limit on how many seeds. We track the provenance and we also work very hard not to mix populations. That's important. Remember that because of a story that's coming up. Not mixing populations because with plants, we're trying to keep all genetic individuals moving forward through time because plant genetics are where those are the tools plants have to adapt, to flower earlier, to flower late, to stay short under the mower, not worried about a mower, we're gonna grow tall, to self-pollinate or cross-pollinate, to withstand uh, drought, to withstand monsoon, to withstand early freezes, all those genetic options, that's what plants have to survive changes. So we're trying to keep all the genetics moving forward through time, which means all the individuals that we can through time. And so we have, here we go again, bringing it back, a high regard for wild sites. Yes, and those wild sites include roadsides and rights of way. So many of our imperiled plants need sun and they need sun. So they eke out their existence on rights of way. And no, you can't. If you see a rare plant on the side of the road and you say, oh, they're gonna just spray that anyway or the Forest Service is just gonna cut down those trees anyway and hurt that. Mm -mm -mm. No, no, we don't take these plants from the wild. We don't dig them up. We work on their um, management on the roadside and actually GDOT, Georgia Department of Transportation and the Forest Service and Georgia Power becoming some of our best partners and they are changing the roadside management. Another story, very exciting one. So we have regard for even roadside populations. We don't go out and take plants from there because we think they are, might get hurt. There is a thing called plant rescues and plant rescues happen uh, organized through the Georgia Native Plants Society. They do a beautiful job and those plants are absolutely doomed because the bulldozers on the site, that's a, that is an official um, plant rescue and that, that, is a, that is okay in conservation ethics. Propagating plants, especially rare plants, comes with a lot of, of, of um, conservation or ethical responsibility. If I'm in a hurry to get to a dinner date with my sweetheart and I'm watering and I don't water the plants along the back window and because of that sunlight, they dry out in the greenhouse, I've just decided, I've just become evolution and decided who moves forward through time. It's a big responsibility caring for living things. And then we have to find wild homes, places where these plants can go live. And like I said, we, we prioritize on state and fair lands, but most of our diversity is on private land. And we do work to cultivate relationships with land, private landowners. And please, please, this plant needs only the soil. And we see on the map, you have the soil on your property. Could we plant some? So we try. Alfie, I'm checking in. Are we doing fine with questions and time and all? I'm just checking in with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're doing we're doing fine. Um, okay. So yeah, yeah. Keep on going. I'm gonna keep going. All yeah. right. So finding these wild sites and making sure that the wild sites are ready to receive plants. So we have to spend a lot of time getting the invasives off first and getting the land restored so it's ready to receive the rare plants. And then we're going to be managing them and monitoring them for not the next 50 years, for the next forever forever. We, we've learned that we cannot walk away. We've had a few species. We thought we've gotten them to that maintenance phase. We can, we can monitor them once every two or three years. And you're about to hear a story. Um, we were taught a hard lesson. Here comes the story. We like to teach through stories. So mountain bogs are a very special place. This is a mountain pitcher plant bog with carnivorous plants, with orchids, with cinnamon ferns, the most critically imperiled habitat plant community in the entire Blue Ridge Mountain Appalachian system. And there are two mountain bogs left in Georgia when we started this work. And one of those was on private land and one of those was on public land. And look, it's a G5S1. You're like, G5, Jennifer. Yeah, this species occurs all the way up to Canada, the purple pitcher plant, but it's an S1. 
there's just a little bit left in Georgia and it's the southern part of its range and it has important genetics that are different than the more northern population. So we have to keep it going forward through time. So two bogs left, one on private land and they manage their bog beautifully. I'll tell you their story. The other one owned by the Forest Service, 17 plants left. So our bog fathers, Ron Dieterman, Henning von Schmeling and Tom Patrick went in and took, took little root divisions of those 17 plants. And this was the last mountain bog in 1992. That's Cindy Wentworth, for the Forest Service employee that was looking at the smooth cone flower. She's my mentor. She taught me how to monitor plants. She taught me how to use a compass, all the things. So this was the last mountain bog. That does not look like a sunny bog habitat to me. We have to create habitat. We have to mimic what animals would have done. And those animals would have been beaver or elk or buffalo. We don't have such. So we have to go in there and remove the woodies. And then from those 17 plants, the Atlanta Botanical Garden grew those plants up, got them to flower, crossed them by hand, pollinating the little flowers, collected seeds and grew them again and grew them again and grew them again, always mating them within the 17 plants, that one Georgia population, not mixing them with purple pitcher plants from other states. And then, so, okay, we have this as a backup, that's good. But then we wanted to bring them back to the wild. And so we've put them back in that original bog. And through time, we have created six other safeguarding sites from that original founding 17 plants. Um, you can see in the bottom left picture, there are some little flowers. So flowering is a sign of vigor, making fruits, and then mind blown when endangered species makes babies in the wild, like pandas in the zoo, we lose our minds. And we have had, we call it seedling recruitment. We've had seedlings, we've had babies of our mountain purple pitcher plants in this restoration effort. So this was good. We had a rhythm, we had the original bog, six other sites. The other one I told you that was privately owned, the original mountain bog, all of their pitcher plants were poached from their property. I cannot tell you where these safe growing sites are and I have to be work really hard when I take pictures to make sure my camera settings are not recording um, location information. I have to be careful not showing you any landmarks in the background where you, where a poacher could try to sleuth out where these populations are because poaching is ongoing. But our, our partners, the Forest Service, the Department of Natural Resources, volunteers, we come out and we monitor and we check and we keep putting these purple pitcher plants back out. And they're the little babies. So five sites, we've got babies at all the sites. We're doing so good. We're monitoring, we've got seats in the seed bank. We're, it, everything's going great until something happened. Now there's Microstegium, it's an invasive. We've got, there's college students in there helping us sworn to secrecy to help the habitat. But do you see the little metal fencing next to Rachel's knee there? That's because of this. In 2017, that was the winter where there was the fires, the fires in North Georgia, the epic drought um, hogs hit all the sites. All our safeguarding sites were turned over. The pip, purple pitcher plants just there. Sally and I, we went and we were just shoving plants back in the ground. All our mapping and tracking individuals, we don't care, just get, shove them back in the ground. It's a wetland, they'll live. Um, so trapping these hogs, this is the new reality. We now have remote sensing cameras. We have fencing around these bogs. We have volunteers that go out monthly. So we've gone from, oh, we can visit the sites once every two or three years and just check on them to, no, we have to visit them monthly and trek to all these secret sites, specially trained volunteers, specially sworn to secrecy, literally um, because of hogs. So that's a thing. Do we give up? No. We're into this for the long term. We do this again and again. And thankfully, we have the plants and backups. So that was one story. And that was plants from one population duplicated at six sites. Here's another plant dilemma, conservation dilemma. This is a hairy dwarf. I love plant hair. I just do. This is 
Bruce, Michelle, I, Bruce, like sumac. No, it's not poison sumac. It's dwarf and fuzzy and gorgeous. Look, Jennifer, it's a G2, G3. It's rare on the planet, but it's an S1. And other states may have lots of dwarf sumac in their power line right away. Well, we did not. In Georgia, we had two populations. We had two boys and we had ladies and they were separated in the Atlanta area for 150 miles. And bees could not make it between the two. We drove pollen from one site to the other, tried to hand pollen, no, did not work. We brought them together at the botanical garden. The males just got weaker and weaker and we never got them to reproduce. So you can imagine how far this is where the bees have to travel. So these are two separate population, males and females. Most plants are male and female both. These are separate. So y'all, we got wild and we brought the two together. We mixed populations. It was alarming to conservation organizations at the national level. We did this in a novel site, so we didn't put them back into an original Rus Michelei site. We picked a new site, so we're not going to mess up any original populations. Remember, original populations are sacred. And on Valentine's Day, planted the males and the females on state land because that's where plants are protected, and created this little pocket prairie where the boys and girls could be. And they have sat and sat and sat and sat, and we go out and cut and very carefully paint herbicide on the woodies and we encourage and we sing songs and we bring chocolates and we apply fire to this little woodland habitat and y'all it's working. Jennifer, can I interrupt you for one second? Yes. You, we, we, we are still seeing the slide that says find the species and is the pitcher plant bog. I, it sounds like- what? Yeah. Let me stop sharing and share again because that's not cool. Everything was was advancing fine until then. How about now? Yep, that's a different slide we haven't seen. We're good. Okay, I'm gonna go back for just a second. Okay, so picture plants moving on, and now we meet hair uh, another hairy plant, dwarf sumac, Romeo and Juliet, males and females. We got wild. We brought them together, planted them on. Valentine's Day. Restoring their habitat through time. We have many female stems and the males are starting to perk up. We put fire on the land, we keep restoring it. And after many years of trying, seven years of trying, we have fruits. So we, we did all these things at the botanical gardens, several botanical gardens, Zoo Atlanta tried, Atlanta Botanical Garden, State Botanical Garden, Callaway Gardens, Chattahoochee Nature Center. We all have been trying to grow these plants together, but they needed to be in a wild site. They needed privacy. They needed the system. They needed something in the wild. They needed love. And now we have babies. So that's exciting. So we keep going out and we keep managing the habitat. And this just in. So we started in 2005 with two male stems. There are so many stems, we can hardly count them. 1,504 stems, woohoo! We got babies, we got habitat. And it's been the commitment of applying fire and restoring and being aggressive in plant conservation circles by bringing these two populations together. But what else were we gonna do? It's Romeo and Juliet. So, pretty cool. So. This is an article that just came out, I think today, Georgia DNR, Department of Natural Resources Wildlife Blog. Check it out. It's the, the Mincy story. That's Dr. Mincy Moffat, one of the state botanists. And uh, it's a cool story. Plants, hair, fuzz, love. Well, it's got it all. All right, checking the time. We're good. I'm gonna do one more quick story and we'll stop. Back to smooth cone flower. This is a, uh, remember we talked about smooth cone flower, the stems have no hair. Look, it's a G2, it's an S2, only on Forest Service land. 
North Georgia mountains. We talk about populations to county level and then we stop. That's as far as we talk publicly because of poaching. So here's again, Cindy Wentworth monitoring these populations. And I told you the story about the poaching and the seeds and they got caught. So these plants are still vulnerable on this roadside. And why are they on the roadside? Because they need sun and where are the mountain prairies? Well, we don't have them. So we have to move these plants, but the Forest Service says, wait a minute, it's an endangered species. Under the Endangered Species Act, we are required by law to protect it. If we move them and they die, we are in trouble. Heather Alley, my colleague, the ship's captain, this is her when she was a larval scientist. We wanted to move, we professionals wanted to move those endangered plants off the roadside into the national forest, a little more protected. Forest Service said, we can't, if they die, uh, we need a study that shows that that could be done. So her master's thesis was, can we move these plants? Can, do, can we grow them by seed? Can we put out plants? Can, do they have to be one-year plants, two-year plants, uh, four-inch pots, one-gallon pots? Do we cage them, not cage them? She did all the studies. The stats came back that everything works. The plants just need a chance. That's all the Forest Service needed. They just needed to know it could be done. And it was published in peer-reviewed literature. And that kicked open the door for returning endangered species to the wild to these safeguarding sites. It's Heather's thesis. So this is the Heather Alley plot. So since 2000, more than 1500 plants have been returned back to the wild, always collecting seeds from those known populations and returning back to their home populations and not mixing populations because we want to keep all genetics moving forward. And then four new safeguarding sites. And she does this year after year, collecting the seeds, growing them like a crop and putting them back out onto Forest Service land. We don't keep them at the Botanical Garden. We don't let them flower at the Botanical Garden because of bees and regular cone flowers. So there's something we can talk about. So this recovery has been going on since 1999. There's talk about delisting the species from the Endangered Species Act or downlisting it. This is a major commitment. We still have to go out and manage the habitat. But the tools are frog egging. Just cut, keep putting the plants out there till they stick. Keep growing them at the garden till we figure out the protocol and keep it moving forward. This is our safeguarding collection. And um, we do cut the flower heads off every year because bees fly between Echinacea levigata and Echinacea purpurea. And genetic analysis shows that the genetics of Echinacea purpurea, purple cone flower, like we all have, his genetics will win, will dominate smooth cone flower all progeny through time. We'd eventually look like regular purple cone flower and not smooth purple cone flower. Now, you're planting an endangered species out in the wild and you get a drought. So what do you do? You get volunteers to haul water up the mountain and hand water these populations. And you keep detailed records so all the partners know. But again, we don't share these locations. Oh, I'm going to switch it so you can't memorize that. Oh, and we keep at it, restoring habitat. We're creating woodlands. And this is a lot of hack and squirt. I spend a lot of time hauling woody material out of rare plant habitat. So I went to school for a long time to be a professional to haul the swamp woody material out of habitats. The Forest Service is applying fire, y'all. This is Mike Broad. They are, I, do you remember a few years ago, they're burning Tallulah Gorge. Yes, they're burning Tallulah Gorge. It's called prescribed fire and it's restoration. It's gonna prevent catastrophic fire. And, and it's going to open the canopy and create prairies and have wildflowers and grasses that are going to support all these birds that are declining. How many of you have not heard whippoorwills this year? One site that Mike Broads burned, it's called War Woman. Within three years of burnt, of getting a fire program going, they had, um, what are the little birds called? Doves, not doves, quail. Thank you, Alfie. Yes. I was, <laughs> Sorry. I was, I was projecting that, that. Yes, yes. I'm very plant centric. Uh, Quail, they had quail return to a mountain prairie situation because of getting the habitat open. And all they did was thin the canopy and the wildflowers and grasses popped right up and put fire in the land. So this is the goal. 
and all the companion plants like Georgia Aster. Ooh, it's Jennifer, it's a G3, but it's an S2, so we know it's rare. And ooh, uh, Frazier's Loose Strife. Look, Jennifer, it's a G3 S1, and it's in the same habitat. So we're putting back that back in the same habitat. And ooh, Curly Heads, also a rare plant. We're putting those back into the habitat because they all come from this woodland habitat that used to be in the North Georgia mountains. Now, last story. This fella, this, this is Brian Hudson of Clemson. He's been working on his PhD for a long time. He's been looking for this Northern pine snake for nine years with funding with two interns every day, nine years. This snake is six feet long, like an indigo snake. It's buck tooth, it digs holes and creates burrows and habitat, uh, habitat for the critters. And it's amorous. The males will go miles and miles to find another. It's a buck tooth Romeo. I love it. It'll go miles and miles. And the only time they ever see this snake is because it's squashed on the side of the road. Brian Hudson has been teaching wildlife managers about this. Can you find it? Can you find it? Can you find it? He got a call. He drove down. It was a northern pine snake. I got to go to its release. They took it to UGA vet school, put a little tracker in the snake's belly and then released it in the wild. And I got to go. And what was so great was they credited the finding of this rare snake to the restoration of a habitat because of a wildflower, because of smooth cone flower. So for a plant person, this was a pretty big life moment because we do our work for the plants, but for the plant communities and all the critters that that rely on those plant communities. So this was pretty great getting this compliment from our animal colleagues that it was because of smooth cone flower. So I'm gonna stop there.